Hello and welcome to everybody. Um, tonight uh, we're going to listen to Steve Hargis talk about um, what you don't know could hurt you. Uh, my name is Cameron Kasoglis and I'm Director of Coaching Development with US Rowing and we wanted to welcome you to um, our webinar this, this evening. Um, for those of you that are, that are new to, to Zoom, um, which is the format that we're using here, um, there's a question and answer function um, at the bottom of your screen that you should be able to see. And you can type in a question there and, and we, can, um, we, can, we can share that with, with, with Steve um, during his presentation. Um, we appreciate all of you that have, have already um, sent, in, sent, sent us in some questions um, and, and, and indicated which topics you're, you're interested in. I've, I, we've already shared that with Steve, so he's going he's gonna to tailor his comments to, to, to that which you've already indicated you're, you're interested in. Um, we've already done a couple of these webinars um, in January back with, with Liz Fusco and Mary Whipple back in, um, in, in October before the head of the Charles. And we've seen that there's, there's quite a popular reaction to, to, to the content, to the speakers um, that we're, that we're utilising here. And we know that for many of you, particularly out on the East Coast, um, everyone's very much looking to the spring racing season. And, and we're all very excited. For those of you that aren't back on the water, to, to, to be doing that and, and, and we've got, a, got a, a slide up here or a, a photo here of the, the crew classic for those of you that will that'll be attending that. Um, tonight um, we're excited to have Steve Hargis um, with us and Steve for those of you that don't know is the director of the under 19 high performance programs and he, um, he's been involved with our junior national team women back to 99 um, and, and was at the helm of the, the program in 2008 when our national team women's under 19 women's eight won at the world championships for the first time and has um steve has been recognized as a systems builder um honored in this past year in 2018 for uh, being the u.s rowing man of the year um but in addition to that steve's also athletic director at east lime high school in connecticut and he's he's responsible for 65 coaches is that right steve and, and a thousand a thousand different um, athletes, student athletes, um, and in particular uh, has has the responsibility of, 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 of delivering courses for CU courses um, to, as a part of the Connecticut Association of Athletic Directors on safety and legal issues. And I think um, it's a very timely topic. Um, and Steve, we, we, we really appreciate the opportunity for you to, to, to share with us some of your insights. We know that this similar presentation you delivered up in Saratoga uh, back in January was extremely well received. So Steve, uh, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, I like, I think I like looking at faces rather than just the screen, but um, we'll get, uh, we'll get through this. I want to um, put my uh, PowerPoint up first so you can, we can follow along. I have two roles, two part-time jobs. One is with, uh, with U.S. Rowing and it's been that way for a long time and enjoyed all the experience. Uh, um, but my other job actually is one I think that really kind of helps ground me in what I think are really important things to uh, make sure that our coaching staffs um, and our coach management and our risk management teams really take uh, this to heart because this is what we're really here for is to provide a safe environment for uh, teaching and learning. So a lot of the stuff you're going to see tonight is right from the National Interscholastic Athletic Administrators Association. Um, and the other part would be the National Federation of High Schools. And these are the folks that really have a big role to play in how these rules or these um, they're really not laws, but they've, they've evolved over time. And these are like the, the top 14 things we're going to talk about tonight that um, we really have to use as benchmarks and we can go back and, you know, look at how well are we are performing. I'm going to give you some, um, uh, some stories tonight that I'm going to put in a book. I'm going to publish one, one time along the way, which is going to be, you can't believe this actually happened. And we're going to um, talk about, and if some of this stuff make you, uh, you know, a little bit nervous about, gee, if we don't, we're not really there or we have a lot to do and that's okay. That's okay. But um, you have to like pick a few things that you think you want to work on and then we'll move those ahead and hopefully it will have an impact on the safety um, of your, uh, your athletes and your total program. So I think we're going to talk about tonight is um, start off with risk management and um, just as an overview and, I think if you see here that this is really an ongoing and proactive, and I was just looking at the National uh, Interscholastic, and I think I've taken maybe eight of their um, 
leadership training courses. And of the eight, I think five were about uh, legal aspects of it. And the bottom line out of all of those were you're probably, no matter how good your program is, no matter how solid you have created um, this program that you believe is safe, um, the bottom line is you're probably going to end up getting sued. You're probably going to pay some money. And the whole idea is kind of reduce that amount of money. And I hate to be so crass, but that's, that's where it is. And um, not meant to scare anybody, but that's the world we live in today. And we have to be able to uh, react to it and plan ahead. And you're going to see that we're a lot tonight. So that's our bottom line. You see, no risk manager program would totally and completely eliminate all the program hazards, but our, we want to minimize the chance of injury to student athletes, the coaches, the spectators, the officials. We're responsible for the whole thing, right? Um, and so we're going to use this as our backdrop for tonight. I'm not going to get any legalese. I'm not a lawyer. Um, I'm sure we have in the numbers that we have tonight, we have some lawyers. Um, I think you'll agree this is for, uh, again right from the national federation of high schools where we're just trying to make sure we're using reasonable care and that we would expect that um we would have something in place that would not so that we would not be the cause of an injury to a student a student athlete um and and, and others and so if you don't recognize that you have to provide reasonable care and you are even the proximate cause of the injury in other words you are you are somehow tied to it either through the lack of planning, lack of execution, um, then things are going to happen and you will be uh, part of, of being a negligent program. And so really what this really leads to is for us, and this is where the coaching aspect of it comes in tonight, is that we have to recognize that we are trying to demonstrate prudent professionalism. Um, and that is being held at a higher and a higher standard because there's so much data out there now and there's so much, there's so many programs out there now and there's so much awareness made to all the issues out there now that have to deal with, with, uh, with supervised and unsupervised young people and programs that um, really need to be sure that they're doing a better job of it. And so if we look at ourselves as being prudent professionals and we're, here's what we expect. We expect that we know our sport. We know where the possible injuries will come from. We know how, um, what the kids look like, what, what the kids' background are, because we can read about all these statistics, all these sports injuries. I mean, I was just reading an article where um, between the, the students between um, five and 14, the sport that has the most, most deaths um, per year is baseball. Um, and again, if they get hit in the chest and can have uh, some um, impact, uh, heart impact or um, severe uh, head trauma, these are things that, so what are ours? And we should know those. Um, we have now a role of child advocacy. That's part of our program now. We have to have that. Um, in loco parentis, you know, that's one of the ones we have certain amount of parental control. It's been ceded over to us. Anyone in the education uh, business knows that. Um, however, that's, a, that's kind of a tricky area but um, in, in how we handle it. But in fact, we do have an ownership um, stake in these, uh, in these young people. And so it becomes really, really important that we are um, demonstrating that we are prudent professionals. And whatever comes out of this has to go back into training. And so wh what is it that we're gonna train our coaches to do? What things are really important for them to know? And how are we gonna monitor that in fact that they're moving this forward? Now, we will have, I think we do have a range of, from young coaches, meaning uh, first, second year coaches to folks who've been around as long as I have, um, and I think that that has changed dramatically. And so there is much more responsibility on new coaches than we ever had back in that day, because again, we didn't have all this sort of uh, um, litigious um, environment that we're now working in. So here we go. Here's what we need to have uh, happen. We need to have trained professionals that are held to a standard that is higher than ordinary care. And that's really important um, that we, make sure that we are doing everything we possibly can to provide a safe and fun exposure to our sport. So here we go, here are the 14 things. Um, no one's gonna memorize them. Um, we're trying to find a, uh, maybe a break in the program to ask some questions and maybe what we'll do is, maybe about halfway through, we'll take a little bit of a, a break to have some questions um, that relate to those topics. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention from what uh, Cam had talked about, if we don't get to one of your questions tonight or just by um, you know interacting with us this evening, that you would like to 
um, drop me an email, please do. I will uh, endeavor to answer everyone. If we, if you can do it by the weekend, I can get you uh, back answers and uh, we can start a dialogue because this is really important stuff for, um, for folks to, to continue and evolve um, in their, in, in their, in their programmatic um, issues that they're working with. So here we go. Um, planning. All right. So this is the big one. This runs through every single one of these and um, more than others, but you have 14 duties. The first one is planning and planning is overarching. And I put some kind of keywords down here. So make sure that, you know, if we were to use it as bookmarks, that has to be developmentally appropriate. It can't be improper, meaning you have to be careful. When you're, when I talk about improper planning, I'm talking about people who attend a, um, a workshop on, you know, here's how we're going to do uh, lifting. And this lifting happens to be, it's advanced lifting and it's for, you know, young people who are, you know, 18 and 19, yet you coach 14 year olds and you're going to cut them loose and in the weight room and you're going to say, okay, let's do these things because I saw this in a great video or I went to a clinic and I saw this. So really you've got this monkey see monkey do sort of attitude. And what happens is we put ourselves in a really bad spot. So now we're really not providing a, a well thought out plan that makes sense relative to the age group or to the ability levels. So it's not developmentally appropriate. And then a failure to follow a plan. Um, that's as bad as failure to plan because in the end, you didn't really execute any plan whatsoever. So there was no teaching and learning going on and potentially it was not even in a safe environment. Um, I will tell you that um, this, this will get, um, this will cause more issues as you, as you see the trickle down effect. I, I think I highlighted in red and if you see more, let me know. Um, but this planning um, is the number one issue we need to work on um, as far as preparing ourselves to have the right program in place, which will require mentoring. Um, we can't really kind of get away from that. We're going to have to have people that are in your programs or people outside your programs um, that can help and mentor, the, especially um, the, our newer coaches um, in our industry. All right, supervision. This is the number one issue in sports and um, athletics today. And when it comes to supervision, I will tell you, I have had to let in the last um, six years and in, in six of those years, I've let four coaches go because of lack of supervision. That's a problem. This is um, the number one issue we have in high schools today. And we're talking about a couple different areas. So for example, you have general supervision, you're walking around just because you walk around a boathouse or um, in, it happens to be in your school and you happen to see things like in these common areas, like locker rooms, phone areas, waiting areas, whatever those areas may be, um, especially with all the other issues we have um, going on in schools at the same time. Um, if, if you're not providing supervision and you're not stepping in and playing the role of the adult that's supposed to be you know, in that area, um, or see something happening, you need to answer the right, ask the right questions. This is a responsibility. And if something happened there and you were in that area and you didn't say anything, that's going to be a problem. More importantly, you have the specific supervision of student athletes. So your area. So where are your, where are your student athletes going to go that you think they need to have supervision by an adult? Well, number one, um, I would make sure that I had an idea how I was, what my locker room policy was going to look like. And that's a touchy one because you have coaches that say, I'm not going to hang out in, the, in a locker room because that's a whole other, you know, kettle of fish that people are concerned about. Um, some people are, are making them put cell phones outside of locker rooms because of all the issues with the cameras and all the other um, technology that comes right in your cell phone. And then we have this whole, whole idea of supervision where people kind of treat it Treat it kind of cavalierly, meaning um, I have a boat on land, I have a boat on, on the water, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell someone, hey, I'm just going to be just around the corner. So, so when, when, when the other coach gets there or when the coach gets there, get the boat and bring it and bring it up. We'll meet you out there. I think we see that that possibility of something, something bad happening is probably pretty good. They were your responsibility to supervise them, and that plan needs to be in place, um, and, and it needs to be – communicated to everyone about what that what that means um we have a in our area we do a lot of running in hallways somewhere in connecticut in the winter months and so the uh, rowing team is typically involved in that as well as other teams so we can't set, single them out but um i will tell you about 11 years ago through lack of planning meaning they're going to not only use the hallways to run in 
but to use the, the, the hallways to sprint side by side, which was directly against the rules, under the supervision of, a, of an assistant coach who let them run, a young man tripped this other young man who did a face plant into a, a center block wall. Um, it cost our district a significant amount of money. We're still paying for that man's um, education and his uh, post-education uh, issues for you know rehab and programs like that. And so this is something that, A, should have been planned in a much better way. Second, it should have been supervised in a far better way um, and left the school and the school district up to almost unlimited liability. The other issue that we're finding to be a real, um, a real concern is I, I don't know what you all do when you come back from, the, from races or from trips or when, wherever you happen to be with your team and what your rules are either in your club or in your school and how you supervise uh, the student athletes. Ours is you can't leave until the last athlete goes home if the school is um, closed for sure. But even if the school is still open and the custodian may be inside or if you have another place where you – but we never leave – um, athletes there, even if the school's open, with, unless they have an adult present. That's an important piece because we're finding this more and more, and more as uh, being uh, an issue of lack of supervision and parents um, also being concerned as they should be. Um, if you left someone even at a school where there was a custodian who could have been there, that's not something, that's not his student athlete, that's your student athlete. All right, number three. So we need to be able to assess the conditioning and readiness to participate. It is critical that everyone has an up-to-date physical. Typically, they let physicals run for 13 months in the world of physical because you would get a physical each year and it gives you a chance um, in case you can't get it, you know, exactly within a year. We need to make sure that, that the condition that we're doing um, is progressive. So to go from less to more rigorous is always an important piece of it. Um, it is critical that we pay attention to the heat index for uh, temperature, humidity, hydration. Again, in this part of the country last year, we had some huge issues with that heat wave that came through. Um, so the heat index was being measured every day at our school. Our, our athletic trainer took control of that. We did not go out and participate in any sports unless it was under the guidance as far as um, how often do you have to have water breaks, when did you have to be in shade, um, could you not, if you were training on using and using the uh, – the turf field, uh, could you be on that um, up to what, what hour could you get on that? I mean, is it cooled down enough for you to be on that? Um, is the athlete, um, do they have a readiness to be able to train? Have you, is there conditioning in um, the right place where they can actually continue on uh, in a training program? And also we have to look, it's, it's based on age. I mean, you have maturity of athletes plays a big role here as to whether or not they are prepared to, uh, to accept some sort of training program. And the other piece here is there's typically, in most high schools, there's a 10 day rule for when you must have 10 days of conditioning before you can start any of your, uh, your season plans. So that's, that's important to know as well. Um, the other piece is like, we're already doing this for Tokyo for the U19 team. Like we were supposed to be going over there in, um, in uh, August and when, or July 31st, I think we uh, leave. And right away, the temperature, humidity issue, and heat index is uh, a problem. Like, we know that that's a problem. We've been, we've been told it's a problem. Uh, we had some uh, folks from the, the LOC talk to us this past year um, at the Czech Republic um, because of, uh, again, giving us as much notice as possible as to the concerns. These are high-caliber athletes, but they're not, you know, immune to issues like the heat index um, that they potentially could have over there. So... We're working on cooling vests. Uh, it's about the planning, right? We're working on cooling vests. We're working on tubs. We're working on all these things that our, potent, that our athletes can use that potentially be on the team. We will have them in place during the selection process and during the training process. So it's not just something new they're trying out over there. Um, and again, we're talking about something now. It's in February or March, and now we're looking to you know, put these in play in August and all the things around that. So these sort of expectations would fall on the coach or whoever is running that program to be sure that they're taking, um, taking steps to make sure that the athletes are prepared and that all of the elements around the athletes are already planned and ready to go. Four, um, so here's the safe playing environment facilities. This is um, 
I, I mean, every, like, why wouldn't you want the, uh, your environment to be safe? But now you need to be sure like how you set it up that it makes sense. Um, who inspects your facilities? Uh, I'm not talking about the equipment now or the boats. I'm really talking about the place where you have it. Could include the docks, could include the ramps down to the dock. It could include anything around the, around the boathouse. Um, who handles that and are there regular inspections or do these things, you know, sneak up on us in the locker? Uh, you know, maybe we have uh, oars outside in a locker, you know, situation. We just can wait for that door to fall off because the hinge wasn't, you know, put back on for the last three months sort of thing. Um, certainly you will have building, um, building laws as far as, you know, how you are supposed to uh, monitor uh, the safety of your buildings. And we need to be sure that if you're going to have places for spectators to sit or, or other areas where you have third parties involved, you have to make sure that those areas are, are uh, good as well. So this should be pretty straightforward, although I will tell you, and I'm sure you have seen, there have been some pretty sketchy boathouses I've seen um, over the last 20 years that um, I would be concerned that they're not being regularly maintained. And at some point, it's going to cause it's going to cause an issue that's going to have to be rectified, and probably cost a lot more money that could have been set up in the very beginning. So let's talk about protective, protective gear. I guess we don't talk about that too much in rowing. I mean, there's a lot of other stuff. This really is duty number five. It's really geared towards football, um, as you can probably tell. Um, there's probably some other stuff. Lacrosse may fall into that. Um, I guess baseball. If you're a catcher, there are some uh, issues going on there. So you have to be sure that all this is taken care of, that you have the appropriate type, that you have it distributed, that you have, um, you've given clear instructions on how to use it. Now we do have this in our world, right? So uh, we have life jackets and that's really an important piece. And we have to make sure that people know how to put them on. I think you would be surprised if you are teaching, uh, you're coaching novice or rowers right now, if you took out some, um, some of the newer designs of the um, life jackets, I'm not so sure they would know how to actually secure it around themselves so it doesn't just fall off as soon as they get into the water. I mean, these are not usually very big people. Um, so are you showing them how to use that? Because one thing, having them in the launch that you're going to throw to people um, or give to people, and then do they even know how to use it? Um, I, unfortunately, have a, was a uh, expert witness in the trial where um, a young man um, fell out of the back of a, uh, of a launch and did not have the lanyard or for the kill switch and um unfortunately he died and this is this is um whether you want to call it protective or safety these are things that not only um, affect your athletes but they also affect your coaches in a really in a really uh, tough way um, and i've also had the um the most amazing thing that I ever heard, I was down on the school call, a good friend of mine, another graduate of the Coast Guard Academy, got speared in the back by, it was two singles that um, hit head-on collision. And um, the one boat that ran into him in his back did not have a bow ball. I think we all agree that that's a pretty significant piece of protective equipment. And the ramifications of that um, could, they were, I mean, they were life-altering. So now we have a couple cases where just those little things, the lanyard with the, with the ability to have the kill switch um, activated, when they have bow balls, like how can that not be part of something that we would check on a regular basis when we care about the safety of our athletes and our coaches? And I know these seems like little things, but you now these little things are now potentially can, could um, end with a loss of life. So that's a, that's a pretty uh, tough one. Uh, proper instruction. You know, the, the biggest thing that's going to come, come back to you if, if there was ever any incident at all, um, especially with uh, young athletes, and there was, an ac there was a, some sort of um, accident that caused um, or some sort of thing that happened with this, uh, with this rower, um, and you weren't able to show that you did the pro a progression of skills versus, you know, you went to the end game first. Like, uh, I can just think about lifting for a second. So, um, you had rather than go through, um, you know, we're going to start here at this weight and this, and we're going to build up, we're not even going to start with weights. We're going to start with body weight and we build up with weights. And then, you know, a, a pure progression of skills that were in your plans, of course. And that's why I put that there. You're like, I'm still putting plans in every single one of these. Cause if that wasn't planned, now you're open for liability. Once again, that wasn't ordinary care. That was something you, you basically said, listen, this is a free for all. You got to grab whatever weights you need to grab. You know, we need to get strong for the, for the spring, go at it. And that again, probably is not going to end well. 
And so when you talk about proper instruction and how you do your instruction, this has to be laid out in the plans that you're going to put forth. And if you're a teacher, then you know how to do plan. But if you're not a teacher, how hard it is to do a plan? And I'm not talking about today we're going to do weightlifting, right? That's a scheduling issue. That's not a plan. A plan is this is what we're going to do from we're going to we're going to do our our, our uh, dynamic warm up from this point to this point. Then we're going to do um, then we're going to go in and warm up with the uh, in the weight room, or we're going to go and do some work on the erg uh, because you know that's our that's part of our plan. Here's the workouts going to be in the erg. Here is and you can post all this stuff. Like all this should be easily found and something that you should be able to generate for everybody, and that will make sure that you are staying in uh, in safe waters. All right. Um, matching and quitting participants. We really don't have this again. This is more of a thing that happens most of the time in, in the weight room, but in rowing, again, this one is really pulled over to things like soccer, football, and, and, and the like. So I'm not so worried about this. I mean, yes, you can have a real mismatch of strength and skill in some of these boats. Um, could that cause, some, cause something to happen with, a, say, a less talented rower or a less strong rower or someone of a different size? Potentially, potentially, but... Um, we don't see this um, a lot. I'm going to stop right there for now. And maybe we can have a few questions that relate to these topics we talked about so far. If um, you have a question about those, um, or if you have, we can take a couple of questions that people just had in general. We can get those on the table so we can get some of those taken care of tonight. Steve, one question that's come up is just about planning. Um, as, as you know, a lot of the people on, online are trying to do multiple things. They're either rowers and coaches, they're coaches and administrators. How do you, um, ha how do you instruct or, or, or direct people in terms of the planning process? Because obviously you've already highlighted how important that is. In our... Uh school each of the head coaches is responsible for reviewing the practice plans of all the assistant coaches in their group and that's a written document so it's like here's what the goal of the practice is here's what i'm going to do here's what the three things i want to make sure that i cover and here are the time slots where i'm going to be doing this skills which would definitely be a skills progression it's an outline this doesn't have to have you know a paragraph for each one but there is what the activity is that's going to happen um if if they used anything, uh, if they used anything outside of that, like if I'm doing track and field, I'm using a javelin, or if I'm, it doesn't matter what the sport is, but if I'm going to be, uh, you know, rowing, I talk about what boat I'm going to be using, and talk about what the what the distance I'm going to go, what the rating plan I'm going to be, what the rest times are going to be, um, you know, my my general traffic pattern that I'm going to be in. It doesn't take that. Most of it, you can just fill in the blanks um, and make a little template for yourself. Yeah. Uh, but so the whole idea is, what is the goal of the practice? Because here's here's what's happened. And this happens even from novice coaches up to the highest level coaches. I just have one question. If you didn't write down or put a goal in place of what you were supposed to do during that practice, then it seems to me that you're just going to kind of wander around to, um, uh, to address any issue that comes up. And maybe that's not even one of the ones you want to train. Does that make sense? So if you didn't even know what you want to do that day of practice, then how are you going to teach it? It would be like walking into a calculus class and say, hey, um, you know, I'm not really sure what, what, what I want to tell you. I'll talk to you about today, but, you know, um, I really should probably have some plans about what I want to teach you today. And I think that that's not, that is not asking that much because people can do it a week in advance. Like we want, we would rather see it a week in advance. And so you have six pieces of paper in front of you and it's a template that people are just filling in because we'll force you to think through what exactly is you want to get out of each of these practices. And it should fit in your overall progression of your program. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I'm going to, I'm going to just open it up. Pam has a question, Pam. I've just um, unmuted you. So you should be able to, um, you should be able to, to, to um, ask your question to Steve now. Hi, Pam. Um, Pam, where are you? Let's try that. No. Maybe Pam, if you type that in, are you, are you there, Pam? No. Maybe if you type it into the, uh, the, the, the question and answer box at the bottom there, we can, we can bring that up um, when, uh, when, you, when you type that in. Um, all right, Steve, why don't, you, why don't you continue on there? Okay, here we go. Um, so we talked about number, uh, number eight. All right, let's talk about nine. It is really important. Like we have a parents meeting 
that um, you point out to the parents and and we do it in writing as well um, that we have to give most high schools in the state of Connecticut have to uh, basically provide information to the parent that is their um, signature that allows their athlete to participate. And it, you know, on the particip participation form, it points out how serious the in any sport that there's inherent risk. However, in our sport, we have these additional risks. And we really believe that that's an important piece of it because they have, we can't have them come back later and say, but you never said that this was a possible issue for us. Otherwise, we never would have had our child do this. And this has been used before. And so it's really important is that we are detailed, and that's why I put them clear, and is sport specific. It can't just be a general thing that goes across, you know, all sports because it's just not true. I mean, everyone has their own, their own uh, things that are more risky than others. I mean, not every team, the baseball team doesn't go out and row in 50 feet of water on the Thames in the Connecticut. Like, doesn't want to do that. So we would talk about things that happen on our, in our world, that we will be in deep water. We will be um, at risk of, um, you know, hypothermia. We will be at risk, and those have to be laid out. And that's the important piece because it's, because that's going to be um, what you are going to plan your safe practices to avoid. And although a lot of people will throw waivers out there um, and you try to say, well, this is my disclaimer of liability, you know, all that really does, well, it doesn't do much in a court of law. And I don't, I don't, again, I don't know how many attorneys we have here, but I think you would agree. We've seen too many cases where that's not the case. Um, and I think it's kind of a, a false, uh, false uh, reality um, but it does draw it does draw their attention to the risk of participating in that sport and so there's there's nothing wrong with repeating that but you're not going to get a lot of uh, relief because you had someone sign a waiver and say oh I'm not responsible something happens no no you will be you will be responsible Steve that's a good one um, because Pam's question um, actually just came through on the text and she asked she's uh, with regard to novice coaches if a parent shares that an athlete's anxious, what does, what would you, um, how would you guide a coach um, to work with that athlete and maybe also the parents to deal with that? Um, I guess the question would be from maybe we get some more detail, but um, it really depends on what are they really anxious about? Um, typically it's uh, younger um, athletes and they're not like, she's a novice coach. I'm sorry. She's a novice of a coach of novices um, that, we have, we would typically, I would, I would try to pair them up with someone who, um, I think we would have mentor with coaches. I would have someone either in his age grade or a little, or maybe a one year older. So it's close enough to him so that he can have someone there who can walk him through. Um, we have anxious kids that walk into the weight room for the very first time. Forget about the boat piece, the rowing piece of it. Just kids that walk into the weight room when they're 13 or 14 years old and see what goes on in there. If they see if there's especially other people in there, especially guys, start to get a little bit antsy and want to shy away from that. So, um, you know, we, we kind of have buddy them up with someone, our coaches would buddy them up with someone and um, help take that away. And then obviously we do everything that everyone uh, that you expect a good teacher to do, you know, you would check in with that athlete. You would be sure that, um, you know, that you're taking, you're taking a great interest and want him to enjoy it, have fun. Um, and in doing that, um, you know, some of this is, I think it's going to fall by the wayside. Go on. Thanks. Other questions? Um, I think that's, that's, that's all we've got for the moment, but I'll, I'll let you know if any others come up, Steve. Are there are a couple others on there that on first came out. Cam, do you have access to those? I'll yeah, sure. let me, I'll pull those up actually. Um, what about, um, what about um, the type of, of return to sport policies? Um, what, what, how, do you, how do you address that one? Actually, we have um, – we'll get to that in a second. So that's a good one. So what, all right, okay. so let's, we'll get that. No, that's perfect. It's just around the corner. Here we go. All right. We're, so um, this is really not necessarily at the coaches uh, at the coaches level unless you're all head coaches in here. But um, it is important that all your – that you have an idea of um, what, what um, insurance your athletes have and even at the high school level because you have to provide some supplemental if there's an issue – but again, I wouldn't bog you all down with uh, this other than um, if someone is not checking this, it would be important, I think, for that program to be sure that there is some sort of insurance so you can at least 
know what your outstanding liability potentially uh, could be um, and what the deductibles are that you might be responsible for if there was a um, if there was an issue. Um, so I would at least have whoever your senior person there is to uh, look look these things up. It's not trivial. It's not trivial, but it's not necessarily in your domain. So um, let's not spend too much time on that. And now here we go. This is this is the one that answers your question. Um, so let's assume we have a we have a uh, issue, and we want to make sure that we have some sort of condition that's happened. We need to get immediate medical assistance. Uh, we're going to have to have our folks have uh, first aid, CPR. Of course, they do. And um, we have procedures for calling and coordinated response. We call 911 and uh, we tell them where we are. And of course, if there's anything we can use, look, I mean, immediately, we all have issued with first aid kits issued to us, correct? Of course we do. So all those things we already have in place. Um, and now we're gonna make sure that we have adequately trained athletics personnel that's in, in, our, in our world. And now we talk about, okay, so now this person has been, let's just say they're um, injured, not in a way that it's going to um, be, you know, incapacitating for a long time. It's just going to be that they're out for uh, a practice. And at the end of the practice, they say they're feeling a whole lot better. And for me, once you tell me you have an injury, an injury, that's different than, oh, I tweaked, uh, you know, I tweaked this or I tweaked that during practice. If you have an injury, you're not participating until you go to the trainer and you get cleared. For me, that's the safest. And that's the easiest bet. Um, one of the things we have to do, though, is to understand, and I want to look at this for a second. I got to go back one. Um, is to have their medical history. All of, all of our coaches use, um, we had an app that was, um, that was put together uh, for us. And, and on this, we have, I don't know, I can put it to the camera so you can all get a quick look at it. Um, we have all the emergency medical forms, all the emergency medical forms, you really can't see it, but I can show you what we got. Of whoever's on your team, we have those emergency medical forms right here. So they have it right here in case if someone does it taken away, or um, if it's just something that you need to find out whether or not, say something happened where, um, they had an allergy to this, you know, whatever you were at a, uh, you were at a race and some guy gets stung by a bee. You didn't realize that they had, and that is going to be an injury because we didn't realize that this person had, or you did realize because you had this sort of information available to you that you had to have some sort of EpiPen with you. Um, and this is what's going to kind of be the difference between him doing well or him having a really tough go of it. And I think we want to be sure that we have all the information we need. It does no one any good to have these emergency care, these medical forms uh, for medical history form sitting with pieces of paper in someone's file cabinet in the athletic office or in the club, club main office. Steve, who um, uh, developed that app for you? Uh, we did it, we did it in um, concert with our uh, ECC sponsor here in, uh, in Connecticut. So our conference, our conference uh, sponsor did it with us. Uh, we okay. changed it. Uh, we changed it a lot, though, over the last uh, two years. And if and someone wanted some more information about that, could they contact you directly? Yes, and I could give them all the information because um, yeah, I could hook them up directly with them. Okay, awesome. awesome. I mean, to put this, to have the medical history with us is invaluable because you know if the person's going once they're going into the ambulance, you're showing the stuff to the EMT. EMT now has a much better idea than um, before. He would have zero idea of yep. what the person' medical history is. Um, we also have, which is really important, a return to, pro, return to practice protocol and return to learn protocol for concussions. And yes, I know our sport is rowing. And I know that you know, we're not going to concussions that much. Here's two things that happen. I, I can tell you we've had two concussions this spring already you know, on our rowing team for people getting whacked in the head with riggers. Wow. I, I can't tell you why that's happened. Um, we certainly are having discussions about it but now we have this going on, right? So our whole idea is that we want to, we want to make sure that we take care of these people. Is anyone here from East Line? <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know if anyone, uh, anyone types in. Um, there was a good question that just came in about uh, doing a safety audit. Um, what's, what, what's your response to that? How often should it be done? Who should do it? Um, is that something that, that you initiate in, in your jurisdiction? 
um, as it relates to safety orders of programs. I'm assuming you're talking about, are you talking about safety? Can they, can they clear up a little bit as far as a safety side? Are they talking about like what we have in place already? Like we're talking about here, like emergency care and things like that. Or are they talking about equipment and facilities? I think both. I think it's the overall just assessment of, of what's okay. in place. Yeah, I would do, I basically sit down um, each, I do the safety audit in combination with our, um, of the program and what is going on with our program when I sit down with the head coach at the end of the year. The part of it is a review of all of the, the programs we have in place and how they did and how we can change them. So, and that's all based on the coach, the, what we do for our, we do a self-reflection and they, they, and they put down there what areas they want to have improved to make their program a better program, including, you know, a, a safer program and one that has, that yields the least liability. And so we, we have those discussions at the end of the meetings. Right. And those are, real, those are really valuable because you can really find out kind of, and I treat it with that way as, as self-reflection because it's not yes, no, yes, no kind of, you know, sort of thing. It is, it is really a way in which also they can ask for, um, you know, they want to go for personal, for um, professional development. This is a place for them to identify those areas because they want to grow in that area and then you know, make the program a better, safer place. As far as the other um, things, we have a really good, really good facilities uh, management um, system that our, our facilities folks use in our school district. Um, and I was just talking to someone today about our bleachers and our main, in our main gym, right? Like this one has not been put on to a, um, a every other year kind of rehab. And um, we wanted to get that done, you know, very soon, like this week and get it onto the schedule. So we allow, we rely on facilities people to not only, um, you know, do the ancillary sort of stuff, but also to look at things like the boathouse and all of our other, and our dock, and those things, we don't leave that up to the coaching uh, staff nor myself to do that. All right, I'm, I'm noticing we've got only a couple of minutes left. Steve, do you want to um, do you want to wrap up the slides, and we might have time for one more question? Yeah, I think we're pretty good. Um, I'm going to talk. Uh, the only other thing we want to talk about was let me just back up real quick. Um, emergency response plans also on the app, so we uh, put this on there. So the East Lime High School. Um, athletics app. So emergency plans are on there. Those are important, uh, very important, um, because you need to know what happens. What happens if there is some sort of event that's going on? Like, for example, we had a robbery, you know, right down the street uh, from our school. What would you do then? Um, and so that's an important piece. Where do people go? Where do people uh, sequester? Where do people go? Um, where were they, they're going to be in a safer place? Where are athletes should go? Um, I'm not, I think we're, the rest of these are very self-explanatory and I think we can answer some more questions. Cool. Um, there was de definitely Steve, a question about, um, initiating change and definitely, um, I, I I've seen this as well. You know, there, there are definitely programs that are resistant, to, resistant to change. How do you, um, how would you advise someone to, to approach, changing a culture and, and, and moving it towards a safer, safer environment. How do you in introduce that is, is essentially the question. Yeah, I guess um, I'm a pretty direct guy, as you know, Cam. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that I, I, would, I would first try to understand where they're coming from and why they don't think that these, these, these changes need to be made. Need to be made. Um, and then I'm going to be really, I'm going to be a sticker for this is the path we're going to go down. Yeah, you have to go down this path. You can't. You're, you're talking about too many things here. You have young people's um, safety and lives at risk. You own that. So everything we can possibly do. So there are no excuses for why it's not important. And so either it has to be done, or this probably isn't really the place you want it to be. I mean, it, it can't. This is not. These things are not negotiable. Yeah. Now, put a timeline in place you can say i need to have this done in two months this done in three months this done in six months and by the end of you know 10 months i have we, we have a plan we have a program in place that we're all buying into but it can't be you just let it go because someone's giving you a hard time about wanting to implement it well then that can't be your program i did want to talk about duty 14 on this slide because listen it's really important that all of your folks whether they're volunteers or not as a matter of fact uh, 
most pedophiles will be the ones who will become, who, who really, who come in and they say, well, I have some great experience. I've done some rowing in the past and I really believe that I would be a big help here. Well, unless you do a background check or do fingerprinting, you have no idea. And our sport is full of volunteers. And that is the, that is the, 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 the place which we are the most vulnerable. And if they don't have safe sport training, that's the other thing that we need to have because everything that we do is going to revolve around implementing that. So we have a safe program that people feel like they have a part, they have an ownership in and are going to have a productive uh, experience with us. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely seems like you're in addition to your, your approach to it all, it's not something that you just do once and you forget about it. It's definitely a systematic approach of day in, day out, week in, week out, that it's, it's, it's not just something that all of a sudden you turn things around, but it is, it, you, you have a, it sounds like in order to really engage the, the, the changes that you're talking about, it has to be systematic and it, it can't just literally expect to happen overnight. Yep. yep. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, one last question, cause we're just, we're just at the end of, of the, the time slot and it's, it's, it's relating to, to bullying. Um, that, 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 that's, you know, obviously in, in, in and around us all, all in all directions that we see, how, how do you, um, approach the, 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 the topic of bullying, um, particularly to, to, to students that, that, that maybe are potentially, you know, open to, to, to being harassed, whether they're, you know, whether it's a language thing or a background or, 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 or how, how do you set that environment in, in your, in, in, in your oversight? Yeah, that comes at us in many, many, many different ways. So it's really not one solution is going to fit all. Um, I'm a big, I'm a big guy. I'm a big uh, program guy of, I want to talk to these athletes. Um, I want to talk to the people who are uh, doing the bullying. I think those are the folks that most people for some reason don't want to talk to them. You know, they're nervous about um, confronting them because you have heard or seen that there's, there's potential bullying going on. And I kind of want to make sure we get to the bottom of this. And you can let me know why this is going on. Yeah. Whereas I don't, we don't, we don't want to ask them if these people, you know, do you think you're bullying? It's like, Hey, we're seeing aspects of this and we need to talk about this because this is not going to work in our program. Um, if it's for folks who we believe are like, like you're saying, maybe it could be a cultural difference or it could be some language barriers uh, as much as possible we want to make sure that we are checking in with that person or try to get them. I'm a, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a big fan on uh, bringing in um, a buddy or a mentoring person. We have uh, a lot of schools have peers reaching out. We have advisor groups. So find them, find them an opportunity either within your school or your club that they will at least have a chance to have two or three folks who will uh, work with them as they're kind of finding their way through your program or through, or through, uh, you know, their life. Steve, that's great. I really, um, really appreciate uh, appreciate your time. There's, there's, there. We've we've reached unfortunately the end here. Um, and to those of you that may have additional questions, um, please, please make sure that you send those through um, to me, um, and I'll I'll make sure that Steve gets um, gets to to those. Um, we. Um, We've 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 got to a point where we're gonna um, we're gonna wrap things up. We're gonna send out an evaluation and and really appreciate any of your uh, insights into to what what Steve shared, what additional information you'd like to hear from us, um, because this is a, this is the tip of the iceberg in in many respects. And um, I know that there are members of the safety committee, the US Rowing Safety Committee that are on this call and that, that we will be extending this conversation because um, a, a, lot of, a lot of the themes that Steve's touched on here are, are, are in other conversations that are going on. So please um, please feel free to share any feedback that you have with us. Um, and, and my email's at cameron at usrowing.org. Uh, um, and and I'd, 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 I'd like to, again, thank you, Steve, uh, for, for your perspective on, on, on this very important topic and um, at this point I'd like to, to close it off. So thank you again to everybody that's, that's um, participated today, uh, this evening I should say, and um, look forward to hearing from you um, moving forward. All the best with racing in the spring. Good luck everyone. Thank you. <laughs>